Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. This is part two of Josh Honeycutt, deer hunting editor for Realtree.com. Josh just finished up on August prep, and now we're going to be talking about early season. Josh, again, welcome to the show, and let's just jump right into it. Early season has been very good to you, and so let's share with the people why and some tips, techniques they need to think about for early season hunting. Yeah. I don't do anything but hunt really during the early season. And that's as most do no secret powder. You can go out there and dump on the ground and get deer to come in and make everything. Okay. And if you're not seeing them, you know, obviously they, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about baiting. I'm just making a joke. There's no secret formula. Once you get into the season, the secret formula is all the work that you've done prior to the opener. So all the stuff that you did during the post season, everything you did during the summer, basically you've done the work already now all you gotta do is pull the trigger so when come opening day i will do one more camera check on all of my cameras just prior to the opener i don't like to do it the day before the opener but about a week or so maybe four or five days before the opener i will do that one more time and i will continue glassing from afar all the way up to the afternoon before the hunt as long as i can get in there and do that without bumping deer but, you know, and that's all in an effort just to finalize what deer I'm going to end up hunting. If I have multiple target deer that I'm kind of considering, I will choose between the top two or three that I've got on my quote-unquote hit list and see which one is the most mature, which one's the biggest, which one's the most huntable, daylight active, which one has the best pattern to go on. And I'll kind of mash all those things up into an unofficial formula in my head and decide what to do on opening day. So opening days there, I'm not as big on hunting mornings during the early season. I'm not saying that you should. There's definitely situations where you can and where you should. But more times than not, I don't hunt of a morning. Uh, it all depends on how your property is laid out, how your entry and exit routes are, where your bedding areas are in correlation to your food destinations. So there might be situations, geography and terrain, depending where you can actually get in there and hunt deer of a morning without spook. So if you can do that and you think you have a legitimate shot at killing a deer of a morning during the early season, go for it. But most of my properties, there are very few instances that I've seen throughout the years where I could get in there and do that. So I don't do it very often, but it's mostly because my properties that I hunt don't lay out very well for me to do so. Want to become a smarter deer hunter? Know when to hunt, where to hunt, how to hunt? Well, Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created to do exactly that. Because many people have told me they struggle with spending all days in the wood and never seeing a deer. Only shooting does and young deer. Leaving the woods empty-handed way too many times. Found Mr. Wonderful, but just couldn't get on him. Having difficult finding a place to hunt. Recognizing possible mistakes you're making every year. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors who deliver results. If you had these frustrations or struggles, go to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and there you'll find a 13-module course to help you solve these problems. Again, go to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and find some answers. When people ask me, they said, should I hunt in the morning or should I hunt in the evening? I say evening because the, the deer they've seen, probably they've seen coming in the feed or coming out of the woods or coming to water. The water or food, because one, it's hot, so they're going to water. So when I think about that, what's your recommendation no matter where they are in the country? In my mind, unless it's just a dynamite spot that you can get into without bumping deer every morning, you've been spending all this time and effort glassing of from afar, checking trail cameras, monitoring trail cameras. You've been trying, you've focused solely all summer long, 
throughout the preseason trying to home in on afternoon patterns. So you're not out there glassing from afar, generally not at daybreak. So everything you're doing throughout the summer, in your mind anyway, at least in my mind, is focused on, okay, that afternoon pattern, that afternoon bed to feed pattern. That's what I'm focused on. That's what I'm focused on. That's what all my preparation has been around. And so why go in there the next during the opening morning and potentially screw up all of that preseason work? So you've been focused on those afternoon patterns. Again, if you think you have a, a situation where you can go in and kill that deer open in the morning, definitely do so. I'm not discouraging that at all. But more times than not, you're going to do more harm than good. One thing people have asked and said, hey, Bruce, where did deer go? The summer pattern's over, and then they kind of just become ghosts. What's up with that? Yeah, there's a lot of things in factor that factor in there. At least here at home, I see the deer using the same summer patterns until about the middle of September, around September 15th or so. Some of them go longer. Some of them go shorter. You know, some deer change over to their fall patterns the first week of September. Some don't do it until the last week of September. It's different for every deer. But there are several situations and, or excuse me, several factors in play. Primarily, you know, obviously you've got those bachelor groups that's going to break up. And whenever they break up traditionally, that's when they start shifting to their fall ranges. And I've seen about 50% about 50 of bucks, give or take, plus or minus, are going to have a different fall range than the summer range. And that's at least what I see here where I hunt. So that's obviously what's happening. But why is it happening? So again, about 50% of those bucks, if you have a deer on your camera and he up and bandages, well, there's a 50% chance more or less that his fall range simply isn't where his summer range is. Other things are in play too. Obviously at that point, you've had some hunting pressure. That's a week to two weeks into the season, if not more. So if you're, if it's the end of September, deer might start reacting to that hunting pressure. But I think the biggest factor is changing food sources. Food so there's a huge, huge shift throughout much of the country from mid to late September when it comes to food sources. They've been eating green soybeans and green food sources all summer long. I'm not saying that, let's not even restrict this to ag country. Let's put it over on the hill country of eastern Kentucky and eastern Ohio or wherever you might be where there's no ag or very little. Deer have been eating green food sources all summer long. That's what they've been keying on. They've been eating soft mast, depending on what type of soft mast. Some soft mast doesn't start dropping until late September, early October. So that's not really true in, in every instance. If you get down into the south, there's some more soft mass that they key on late summer, early fall. But anyway, the biggest transition is they're transitioning from those green food sources to hard mass. You know, that's when your acorns start dropping. You got your white oaks, your red oaks, your pin oaks, all the huge long list of oak trees that start dumping acorns around the middle to end of September. That changes things. And that can even take place as late as early to mid-October, too, depending on when, when your trees start dropping. And it's different every year, and it's different for every place. So that's kind of a blanket statement, broad statement. But whenever the acorns start dropping, when the hard mass starts dropping, that's going to change what deer do. And it's going to make it seem as if they're not moving during daylight. Most times, they still are, though. They're just moving during daylight in different areas. Now, granted, if the oak trees are fairly close to their bedding areas, all they do is stand up and start eating. So they're still moving in daylight, just like they did whenever they were traveling 100 or 200 yards to get to a soybean field during the summer. But now that food source is much, much closer in general to their bedding areas than it was during the summer. So it's not that deer just don't want to move in daylight now. It's just they, just, they don't have to because the food's much closer to the bed. What I you know, read and heard and talked with folks Let's go back to the oaks. Some like white oaks, and then you get the red oaks, and there's a whole variety of oak trees. And so the only thing I can say is know what's on your ground and have journals about what tree, specific tree, drops at what mm -hmm. date typically. We're getting really anal about this, but deer know what tree is going to drop the best protein for them and when they do it, just like I've seen elk. Circle mountain on the elevation where the mushrooms are coming up. Shroom and bulls. Yes. I've seen it in New Mexico. I mean, I'll never forget it. We just sat on the top and they would just circle the mountain eating mushrooms. And so if you know that, then you can get ahead of them because you can't call them off the food. They're not going to do it, but you can intercept them. And from what I understand, whitetails are the same way. Your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think so. When it comes to those oak trees, well, obviously, at least around here, deer prefer white oaks over any of the others. It has to do with the level of bitterness and acidity within that acorn. The tannin levels are much, much better in a white oak than they are, say, a red oak. And that's why you have a white oak here and a red oak here. And basically, if they drop on the same day, all your deer are going to be under that white oak tree. So it's something to consider. Absolutely. Having a journal, like you said, that's a great point in my mind. Having the historical dates of when they drop, listing whether what type of oak it is, whether it's a white oak or a red oak or a pin oak or a black oak or a water oak, whatever type of oak it is. Yeah, that's crucial and very, very important, especially if you're in an area that has a lot of oak trees. Absolutely. Some people watch deer all season long, and then they get mystified when they switch over. And I like what you said about the deer doesn't have to go 50 yards from where she's bedding to get food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if they're bedding in timber. Now, if they're bedding in some really early successional habitat, if they're bedding in some CRP, if they're bedding in just a thicket that's got a bunch of briars and brambles, if they're bedding in locations that's not already got some big timber in it, that's obviously not the case. They still got to get up and travel. But if you're hunting properties that has a lot of big mature timber on it, or maybe there's some thick growth that's really, really close, it's right on the fringe of some big mature timber that has some good oaks that are dropping you know that's that's the case they just don't have to go very far say you've got early successional habitat right here it's thick it's gnarly it's grown up there's beds all in it and then you've got a row of mature hardwoods right here and then you've got edge of your field right here and big soybeans down here well all summer long they've been up here well they may not have been bedding all the way up here in this thick growth they may have been bedding right there on the edge of that food but say for the sake of the story here let's say they've been bedding up here in that thick stuff all along well all summer long they're traveling through those hardwoods those hardwoods aren't dropping yet they're getting all the way down here to this soybean field and well and you've got a tree stand down here or a camera or something right on the edge of that soybean field and all summer long you're seeing deer there like clockwork daylight activity well then things change that soybean field starts turning it's got a lot of yellow leaves in it or it's all yellow leaves or maybe the leaves have fallen off already acorns have started dropping so all of a sudden you don't get any pictures down on that soybean field until maybe 10 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night when those deer start getting out and start meandering around it's not that they don't want to move during daylight it's not that they've become nocturnal it's just the simplest food and bed correlation and the relation of the two locations, they're just not getting to that field anymore. They're going from that thick habitat where they're bedding at during the day, right there next to them, just to the south. They've got all those oak trees, and they may sit there and feed on acorns for two or three hours before they get out and start going elsewhere. So it's just something to keep in mind, especially when you're looking at these changing times throughout the season. And again, that's not something that should really affect anybody. There's been very, very few seasons where I've seen that transition happen around the opener really can only recall one year where it was that really happened so that's not something that you really have to worry about until we get toward the at the earliest really the middle of september but generally it's happening around the end of september beginning of october is when that really starts to take effect do you want to become a smarter white deal hunter knowing when to hunt where to hunt how to hunt Over the past four years, people have asked me, hey, I'm struggling with spending all day in the woods and never seeing a deer, only getting opportunities at doe or young bucks, leaving the woods empty-handed too many seasons. Located the deer of a lifetime, but just flat out missed. Having difficulties finding a place to hunt, recognizing mistakes that you're making over and over again, and you want to eliminate them. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors, Well, you've come to the right place. Why? Because Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created by me, Bruce Hutchin. It's a 13-module course that'll talk about being lost in the deer hunting forest, never edited, hunted. What is a hunter? What is an adult onset hunter? What rules apply? Finding a mentor, choosing a weapon, finding a place to hunt, scouting a hunt location, stand sites, stand access and exit, reading sign, and when to hunt. All these are available for you at DeerHuntingInstitute.com. Go now to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and sign up for the best deer hunting course in America. One thing I'd like to touch on is cold fronts because summertime, 
we typically don't have huge differences, deltas vary in, in temperature. Yeah, a storm blows through and it might drop five degrees, 10 degrees, or maybe more. But it seems like in the fall, when we have a cold front come through, it changes the deer habitat, I mean, activity a lot more. Let's talk about that. Yeah, cold fronts are huge. It doesn't matter what time of year you're in, what part of the season it is. In my mind, they're big year-round, season long. But I feel like those first couple cold fronts of the season, really the first cold front of the season, is going to be your biggest and most prominent, most effective cold front to hunt during the month of September. And that applies to the people who hunt in states that don't open up until October as well. It doesn't matter when your opener is. The first, especially if you hunt in September, where we're getting a ton of constant, consistent hot weather, and then you get that first good break. You get that first good 20-degree drop, and you get that perfect cold front that everybody dreams about. If that happens during September, I think it's a little more effective than those who have to wait until October to hunt. That said, it's always good, but I think you're 100% right. I think that first cold front, is probably the best bet as far as hunting cold fronts during the season. Okay, million dollar question, why? Why does it increase behavior? And it's not necessarily a difference in the deer's behavior. In my mind, it is more or less has to do with hunting pressure. And I'm coming at this from a point where every property I hunt, I'm sharing permission. I don't have sole control over any property that I hunt. So Obviously, cold fronts have been talked about and written about for years and decades even. People are in tune with with cold fronts now, so hunters keep an eye on those. The reason I say the first one is the key one is because you're probably not going to have as much hunting pressure when that first cold front hits as you will that second and third one. Now, there might be just as many hunters in the woods on that first one as that second or third one, but the deer haven't had time to to react to that pressure yet. So you're correlating... Cold front comes through, even though everybody's taking, they're calling, they're sick. On any given piece of wood, they're just not in tune to the pressure yet. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. I don't think that a cold front in September has any different effect on a deer than a cold front in October or November. But it just goes back to any tactic or any factor that you want to throw out there and talk about. Earlier, the better when it comes to the hunting pressure. I think deer become wiser and wiser throughout the season. And so... I think you're going to see a little bit more daylight activity. I think you're going to see deer move further from their beds on that first cold front of the season, especially if it falls within the first few days of the opener. I think you're going to see much more of a reaction and much more daylight activity on that first cold front of the season than you will maybe later on. Like I said, it all goes back to hunt pressure. Now, you can relate that to any tactic. You can relate that to rain events or or any factor that gets deer on their feet. Things get progressively worse and worse throughout the season if you're hunting places that get pressure. Now, if you're hunting a really manicured property that doesn't get pressured, you're not going to see a huge difference if you hunt it right. If you're personally hunting a property right and you're not spooking deer, you have good entry exit routes, I don't think you're going to see much difference in those. But if you're hunting public land that gets pressured, if you're hunting private land that gets pressured, I think you see the effectiveness of cold fronts and other things that get deer on their feet I think you'd see a decreasing or degrading effectiveness of those things as the season goes on. So that's why I say the first one is the best one if you're hunting pressure places. Josh, do I hunt 24 hours before the cold front hits, right before the cold front hits? I mean, literally hours during the cold front or right after the cold front goes through? I personally don't have a preference, not really. I know everybody's different. Everybody has a different opinion on that topic. I guess more or less, if I'm just like everybody else. I'm an average Joe deer hunter. I can't hunt every day of the week, but I have to pick and choose my battles there. So I would say that if you can get out there right before the cold front moves through or during it or right after, whatever your schedule allows, I think is going to be good. Any time around that cold front, better than it was the few days leading. The key thing is change, and it doesn't have to be a cold front either. It can be a warm front. A sharp increase in temperature, I think, oftentimes get deer on their feet, too. I don't think it has quite the effect that a cold front does. But I think just a sudden change in the deer's environment, whether it's an increase in temperature or a decrease in temperature, if it's been sunny all week long and then, boom, you get overcast skies or you get some light rain that comes in, just change. I think change. I don't think deer like change. I think it gets them on their feet. So 
I like hunting the back sides of those cold front probably, but I also like hunting the front sides of those cold fronts too. And the reason I say that is because a lot of the time, the front sides of those cold fronts have some kind of weather with them, whether it be some rain that comes through. And I like to hunt the rain. Deer move during the rain. Matter of fact, the deer that I killed last year was during the rain. So if you can hunt the front side, great. If you can hunt the back side, great. If you can hunt as it's dropping, that's great too. I think you're going to see an increase in likelihood of success, regardless of which of the three you go with. But I guess my answer to that would be all three, if you can. When we think about early season, you're in Kentucky. So when does your season open up? I think this year is September 7th. It's, it's always the first full weekend in September. So now they're probably still in velvet. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. When do they start rubbing off and their antlers are hardening? When does that usually occur? It's a little bit different every year. I mean, there's a window there, but I've seen them. And it depends on the deer, too. It depends on the individual deer. But it can be as early as the first few days of September. It could be as late as September 15th, September 20th. That's just how it is here. Now, I know it's different everywhere you go in the country, but that's how it is here. Prime example would be I killed my deer last year, September 5th. By the time I actually recovered the deer, it was it was a little bit right around midnight. So I may have been September 6th by the time I recovered the deer because I gave him several hours. But that deer that I killed, he was in velvet. But the big nine, the big mature four and a half year old nine point that he was running with, or one of the deer that he was running with, that deer was already clean out of velvet whenever I shot my deer on the 5th. And the reason I know that is because I saw them both come out at the same time. So shot my deer the afternoon of the September 5th. He was still in velvet, had one little peel coming off of his G2. So my deer, I'd say if I hadn't shot my buck when I did, he would have probably come out of velvet within 24 hours, at most 48 hours. But the big nine that he was running with was already clean out on the 5th. When you think about breakup of bachelor groups, because if you're long distance scouting during the summer, you might see a number of bucks running together and hanging together. All of a sudden, they shed the velvet and the bones harden. Do you see a typical dispersal of the bachelor groups? Yeah, I don't think that the velvet coming out is the trigger. I mean, it's one of the triggers. I think whenever they see the velvet comes off and they've rubbed that velvet and they start sparring and they start tanking the antlers together, I think that's kind of, I think it is the trigger. But based on my experience, they don't break up as soon as that velvet comes off. I think the primary decider of when those bachelor group breaks happen is testosterone levels, obviously rising testosterone. That's what triggers the velvet to shed and to come off. But I don't think that the testosterone has risen to the point yet whenever the velvet comes off for those bucks to really get at, mad at each other and disperse. I think what happens is, and again, I'm not a biologist, this is just my opinion. I think you know, as the summer progresses, you've got pretty level, pretty low testosterone levels when you look at the grand scheme of things, pretty low testosterone levels, especially compared to the fall. But then, you know, you get to the end of the summer and then you get to the, sometime in early September and the testosterone has risen high enough that it causes the antler the, to the velvet to shit. The deer starts sparring a little bit. Maybe a few days go by, maybe a couple weeks go by. But then the testosterone gets to that point where, okay, they start getting mad at each other. They don't want to be bedding close to one another. And I think that's what causes the bachelor groups to break up. Hey, thanks for listening to the show tonight. Before we go, can I take a moment and say thank you? Listen, as we started the Whitetail Rendezvous podcast journey, we had no idea what to expect. But after four years, we received a ton of feedback from our over 400,000 listeners and climbing to half a million. Speaking of which, we are now closing in on over 600 featured guests. Thank you. And a quick shout out to all those who have left an iTunes review and your feedback. I get those and really appreciate it. And it's awesome to see what you have to say. And we do read every single one of them. And I just want you to know that I am incredibly grateful for your kind words regarding the show. And all of the ratings and reviews help us attract more listeners. And if you're one of those new listeners, welcome. Great to have you. By the way, if you haven't taken the time to rate and review our show and like the hunting on private land strategy on how to get permission to hunt a private property, go to whitetailrendezvous.com as a special gift for just rating and reviewing our show. When you get there, look for the start button 
to get the details. Listen, I'll share you the top technique from some of the top hunters in the country on how do they get permission to hunt on private land. I'll share with you the exact techniques they use to get permission. As my way of saying thanks for rating and reviewing the show on iTunes. So join us next time. And remember, we're all on this journey together, learning, sharing, and becoming 365 Hunters. One thing that I've seen and other people have seen, Josh, is that early in September, you'll see football, what I call football scrape, about the size of a football. And I've been come to understand that they're made by young bucks that all of a sudden the testosterone is increasing and they want to start the process. Your thoughts on that? I don't know if I could answer that question. You're saying I've I see the, those smaller scrapes during the early season, found scrapes during the spring and the summer. The deer will scrape you around. The intensity and the frequency is much, much higher in the fall, but I have seen deer tend to scrape in June. They will scrape you around, but I just don't think that it really gets in their head to do it as, as often as they do it during the rut until it gets that time. Personally, I think sometimes, depending on what's located, you got different types of scrapes. If a scrape doesn't have a licking branch over it, I think it's a scrape that a buck made out of frustration. Maybe it's a display of dominance. If it has a licking branch over it, though, it's probably a scrape that's going to get hit more than once. If it's a pretty small scrape, there may be only one buck that's tending to that scrape. If you see a massive scrape, it's probably what a lot of people refer to as a community scrape that multiple deer are using. But I guess that would be my long-winded roundabout halfway answer to that question or that prompt. So let's talk about your three specific tactics for early season hunting. Yeah, I don't know that there's any specific tactic that I deploy. I mean, I don't call, I don't rattle during the early season. It's all about whitetail behavior and basically, I guess, more or less trying to get in that deer's way. More times than not now, I'm hunting a specific deer because I spend so much time scouting and glassing and running cameras. Don't get me wrong, I am targeting a buck now there might be a couple bucks on the farm that i'd shoot but i'm game planning around one specific deer and then if i see another good target buck that's either on my radar or not i'll take the opportunity to shoot that deer i won't pass up on a good buck just because i'm hunting a different buck yeah i guess i'm just trying to get in that deer's way i'm just trying to figure out what his pattern is where he's bedding where he's feeding and i'm trying to get between the two trying to get as close to that bed as I can without spooking him. If I'm hunting a deer that's willing to travel two or 300 yards during daylight, then yeah, sure, I'll get back off the bed closer to the feed. And that's part of what I'm trying to figure out during the summer and the preseason. But if I'm focused on a deer that I know doesn't move very far from his bed during daylight, and that's the case whether it's early season, rut, or late season. But if I know he's a deer that does not like to move far from the bed during daylight, you know, I'm obviously creeping in, getting closer to that bed. The closest I like to get to a particular buck bed that is probably about 90 to 100 yards. I don't like to get much closer than that. You can definitely get closer if the conditions are right, if you have a good wind, if you have some uh, winds at least, you know, 9, 10 mile an hour, you know, you've got some wind cover there that covers your noise. You know, there's, there's different circumstances and different situations. So the, that's not always a fluid, that's a fluid answer. It's not always a constant. But I guess more or less, I'm just trying to figure out what that deer is doing and put myself in that deer's way. With that, folks, we're going to wrap up early season tactics and strategies with Josh Honeycutt from Realtree.com. Josh, thanks for being on the show, and we're going to take a break now and do part three. Listen to this because Josh is going to tell us about his favorite time to hunt during the rut. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.